The truth is I open my talk with these blooper reels in order to gauge uh, the level of the audience I'll be facing. <laughs> and judging from the wild laughter I've just heard, I see I face a group of intellects. <laughs> I, actually, I'm being quite serious. Uh, the biggest laughs we, we get on these reels always come from uh, top universities and, and colleges uh, or for astronauts in NASA or, or showings at the Smithsonian Institution. The, the only place we never got a laugh with the blooper reels was in a showing for television executives. <laughs> which, which, proved, which I think this proves that there obviously is a correlation between sense of humor and intelligence. <laughs> Incidentally, you have just seen uh, three blooper reels, one from each year of Star Trek. Our editors used to, nothing in them is staged. They come from honest uh, pranks and goofs and, and other things which happen, which our editors would put together each year for our annual Star Trek Christmas party, at which time we would, from exhaustion and other reasons, be bombed out of our minds. <laughs> and we would always uh, finish the bloopers and join together in a Christmas prayer that there would someday be a USS Enterprise up there and that its first salvo of photon torpedoes would score a direct hit on NBC. <laughs> oh, oh a actually, actually we've matured in the years since. Uh, uh, hopefully gotten a bit wiser. We realize now that probably the only hope for television is to get all three networks. <laughs> at this point, I should probably admit that I do have a little fun at the expense of television executives. The fact is there are as many good people there as there are in any other large corporation. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, no they, they, it is a fact. They are skilled professionals who represent a very broad variety of backgrounds, such as advertising, public relations, brokerage houses, the petroleum industry, uh, <laughs> law, and other quasi-criminal activities. <laughs> <laughs> My quarrel is really with the system with the nature of commercial television as it exists today. And, and I'll be coming back to that later. Let me say this much now in all seriousness. I will be discussing television in a way you may have never heard before. It's much more than just an inconvenient blot on our culture. What, what it is, what it is and what it may become is far more serious. This device, although still in its infancy, is already bombarding our world with billions of people hours of sound and image daily. It is a device whose power and potency and scope is going to increase at a nearly geometric rate in the near future. And in the end, this strange little thing we call television may be one of the primary factors in deciding the future of this infant race that lives here on Spaceship Earth. Now, having threatened your future, <laughs> Let me talk about some things that brought some of you here tonight. Star Trek, the phenomenon surrounding it, and uh, where Star Trek may be going. In order to discuss the last part first, where Star Trek is going, I must uh, first tell you something about Star Trek fans. As you know, they are a lovely but rather peculiar life form, <laughs> uh, which seems to be born with a pencil or typewriter in one hand and a roll of stamps in the other which is to say they write letters constantly. Thank God, since they save Star Trek from cancellation at the end of its second year by over one million letters to NBC. I, I suspect if our fans gave us much time to uh, mating as they do mailing, they would soon outnumber the Chinese. <laughs> well, they, they've been at it again. Paramount Pictures, which owns the basic Star Trek copyright, has suffered a year-long deluge of mail demanding a Star Trek motion picture. And Paramount has finally cried enough. We are now finishing negotiations for a full-length, widescreen Star Trek motion picture. Thank you. 
We're delighted too. All, all of us on the shore are delighted. Uh, it wasn't easy. In our first meeting, Paramount informed me we would recast it, of course, put in proven uh, theater box office names. I suppose they meant something like Richard Burton for Captain Kirk, uh, <laughs> Robert Redford for Mr. Spock, and, and, and I agreed these were no doubt excellent actors, but I had a feeling that the fans wouldn't be happy with this. It somehow got into the trades and newspapers uh, that this was Paramount's attitude and the deluge of mail started all over again. <laughs> it reached a point where uh, uh, a head of Paramount phoned me rather bitterly. It seemed the fans had gotten his home address. <laughs> and it was taking over two hours to go through his mail every morning and find things like laundry bills and so on. And his demand was very simple, call them off or else, which, which is a little frightening coming from the studio that made The Godfather. <laughs> you know, somehow people in this industry have gotten an idea that I control what fans do. They, uh, as if I've got a secret uh, telephone somewhere where I pick it up and I say, okay, George, we send 10,000 against Paramount tomorrow. And I tried to explain to the Paramount uh, executive the same thing that I've tried to say to NBC all of the years, which is honestly and very simply, if I could do things like that, I would get out of show business and into politics. <laughs> At any rate, Paramount has changed its mind. When we begin shooting a Star Trek motion picture, it will be shot with the original cast, and that, that pleases us. <laughs> Actually, before the negotiations had gone very far, I had a much sure and reliable indication that Star Trek had a future. Uh, my wife began agitating for better lines. And for those of you who don't know, my wife uh, on Star Trek, uh, my wife Majel played uh, nurse Christine Chapel, who you just saw being grabbed by Dr. McCoy. <laughs> and, and enjoying it. <laughs> Speaking of Majel, I should say she, she some people call me the great bird. The networks call me crazy Jean. Uh, Majel considers me a Benedict Arnold of show business. All through her career as an actress, she's heard of the advantages of sleeping with the producer and is fond of pointing out, in our case, it has taken her from co-starring roles down to a starship nurse with memorable lines like, yes, doctor. <laughs> Majel had some hopes for the part when she, le she learned that Nurse Chapel was to be in love with uh, uh, Mr. Spock, but she found out I had double-crossed her there, too, by writing in the format that Vulcans come in heat only once every seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question most af often asked about Star Trek is uh, why the incredible support of its fans? Why on the 12th rerun in some cities is it playing to larger audiences than it did on its original network run? Why the conventions that attract 10,000 fans flying, caravanning in from around the country? And I wish I knew the answers to all of that. Uh, Star Trek's popularity may have had something to do with the subject matter, romantic adventure, traveling into the unknown, uh, discovering new worlds, and that's, that seems to be part of it. I doubt if there's anyone in this audience that hasn't, as a child, uh, built something like a toy raft on a pond and pretended to shove off from the shore and, and, and to uh, unknown adventure on the other side. As, as a matter of fact, Star Trek really may have begun something like that for me. I, I have a surprisingly vivid memory at age three or four on the back lawn of our home, uh, sitting in a soapbox pretending it was a great ship. And I re remember pretending that it was in an in enclosed vessel because I had a second soapbox pulled down over my head. <laughs> Later that afternoon, still sitting there encased in soapboxes, I, I remember my father's rather concerned voice wondering if the asthma attack last fall had resulted in brain damage. <laughs> There's those who believe that the television uh, lead characters, the, the uh, way they were drawn, had something to do with the show's success. Uh, it did come on at a time when most shows had anti-heroes, and the, I, I think there was, it was found refreshing that the Star Trek people were uh, 
real heroes in the old-fashioned sense and that they had great belief in personal integrity, that they believed their word and their oath was their bond, and that there are things more important than personal advantage and personal comfort. Uh, then, in fact, that there are things worth fighting for and, and even dying for, if necessary. And I think this, and I think this is a great part of it. But I think it is less a, uh, I, I say that with less a bow to Star Trek than I do to the uh, to, to the people who who uh, watched it and and felt that way, because without any doubt, one of the greatest hungers that exists in in our world today is for images to admire and to emulate. It's very hard to say right now who you would pick as a, as a model uh, for yourself or your children. The President of the United States, uh, uh, Hugh, Hugh Hefner, uh, uh, Miss Hollander. Yeah, th that's what's happened. I think that uh, what has happened, that lacking real flesh and blood images, a lot of people choose fictional images hoping that uh, these will suffice till uh, flesh and blood integrity comes along again. My own belief is that the show's popularity also had something to do with what we tried to say in it. Uh, that it, was an, it was an effort for us to prove that the television audience is not only willing but anxious to think beyond the petty beliefs that have for so long kept humanity down and kept humanity separated. We, we used to joke that we suspected there was an intelligent life form out there in the audience. <laughs> and we, we plan to use our show to uh, signal some of our thoughts to them. I, m I must admit that never in our wildest dreams uh, did we expect the volume and intensity of replies that we received. A question has been asked me a number of times today is, why does a writer turn to science fiction? And in my own case, it may have had much to do with having been born in Texas. <laughs> oh, true. Right. Oh, you're, quite, you're quite right. Anyone that has experienced Texas politics, science fiction is a very short jump. <laughs> Another question that is asked regularly, can Star Trek be summed up in any uh, one particular statement that we were trying to make? Uh, as a matter of fact, there, there, were, there were two that consistently we were trying to make. First, it was an effort to say that humanity will reach maturity and wisdom on the day that it begins to value diversity in life. That to be different is not necessarily to be ugly. To think differently is not necessarily to be wrong that the worst possible thing that could happen to all of us is for us, is for everyone to look and talk and act and think alike. If we cannot learn to enjoy the small variations between our kind here on Earth, God help us when we get into space and find the variety that almost certainly exists out there. The second thing we were trying to say is, was a statement of affection and optimism for living things in general and for humanity in particular. At a time when many people were saying, it's all over, it's all been invented, there are no more new frontiers, we were trying to say on Star Trek is that it is really just beginning. Nothing in the past can compare with the challenge and the adventure that we have ahead of us, have ahead of us, have ahead of us.